All right, well, welcome everyone to our study of the book of Hebrews. So I want to welcome you to Monday morning Bible study. Um, it's, uh, boy, what, what a strange, strange, strange winter, spring we're having. <laughs> it's just, uh, yeah, yesterday, what was it, 75, and today it's back down into the 50s and, you know, just up 40s. There we go. All right. Up and down and up and down. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we, we uh, I think this year uh, my dad moved to Mississippi to avoid the snow. And it dumped about a foot of snow on him uh, at one point earlier in the year. So very strange. Well, anyway, let me, uh, let me say a prayer and then we will start uh, our time together. So let's pray together. Lord, thank you for uh, this day. Thank you for this time that we have together to wrestle and to ask questions, to think, to reflect, and to be moved. We pray that you are with us now. We have the words to hear, or the ears to hear your word as it's spoken to us through your scripture. We ask and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Um, well, we are, uh, as I mentioned, um, uh, in our study of Hebrews, this is, uh, what is it, session five, I think? Is that correct? That sounds about right. All right. That's what it says at the top. That's good. Uh, so, we're, so we're pretty early on, then, in the book of Hebrews. Um, I think we've gotten now through the first two chapters, and we're heading into chapter three uh, today. What I'd like to do is start, have a little discussion question. Um, it does connect to a certain extent, I suppose, uh, with some of the themes. Uh, but I want to give you a few minutes just to kind of get the juices flowing and, uh, you know, everybody kind of waking up. I need to have my own coffee over here, too. So, uh, so this question is very uh, straightforward and relatively simple, but it does connect to a certain extent uh, to a theme that shows up in our passage today. And I think also maybe we might say an overarching theme in the book of Hebrews, and that is faithfulness. What is faithfulness? So the question is posed, what does faithfulness mean to you? Uh, you can talk about that in a variety of different ways, uh, whether we're talking about faithfulness among uh, friends, among human beings, faithfulness to God, God's faithfulness to us. So feel free to discuss this for a little bit. I'll give you five to seven minutes, maybe a little bit longer, but share at your tables and I want to, yes, and encourage if you're at a if you're at a single table to join another group, and then we'll come back together. 
Another minute or so, and we'll come back together. 
Okay, I'd like to invite you back as a large group. We do have a, a microphone over here. We can start with. Start over here, okay. Mr. Christensen. <laughs> so I put this question up here, um, and it does sound like you are having good conversations about a whole range of possibilities for how to think about this. Um, so what were some things you'd like to share that you discussed at your tables? Is that on? All right. It's taken a few sessions. It only, yeah, it only took two times this time. I said, are you on? Go ahead. We talked a little bit about you introducing me to the idea of God's faithfulness, which I never thought that much about that. I always thought, well, I have faith. Am I faithful? to being a Christian, and uh, it, it just, I mean, it goes back in a number of sessions that we've had with you, and you have shown that uh, it's God, Jesus' faithfulness to us, which is really it, and as Linda said, uh, it, perseverance in that faithfulness is just the essence of our, right up to the end, on the cross. He yeah. was faithful to us. So that's what we talked about. Anything else? So, so the faithfulness of, of Jesus and, the, and God's faithfulness, in yeah. a sense, was what you guys really focused on. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, all right, now, classroom, settle down now. I, Where are the cookies <clears throat> and the nap stuff? I might add a little bit of what you've also added, Christian, which is um, doing. Um, uh, making your faith something that's an action kind of thing as well and doing for others and caring for others and that's something I think gets woven in there. So, so and this I think is an important thing to note in particularly in Protestant circles where we put a lot of emphasis on faith because of uh, impulses that came out of the Reformation and typically we, we, and I'm not saying that this is what we necessarily mean, but it often gets conveyed this way. If you just believe certain X, Y, and Zs, that that's what sort of, but I think what we find is a much richer whole person concept, right? And that faithfulness has to do not only with sort of trusting, but actually acting on that trust, right? Um, following after, right, doing that, that's right, that's right. And that regards both, I mean, that's how we can say God is faithful in a certain sense, right, that God has acted towards us. The same with Jesus. All right. Others? Well, in, in verse 11 of, uh, excuse me, Chapter 11, verse 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And we also talked about confidence and trust, trust in God. Yeah, tr I think trust and uh, trust in particular is a great synonym for faithfulness, right? Trusting um, because trust carries with it both like a, you know, sort of... Um, uh, maybe maybe it's almost passive. I just trust that person, but there's also clearly a sense of active. I trust that they're going to follow through on what they say. They're going to they're going to be the person that I know them to be, et cetera, et cetera. That's great. And then yes, you highlight w one of the things that the Book of Hebrews is known for, uh, which is chapter eleven, right? The hall, the kind of hall of fame of faithfulness. <laughs> we might say, where um, the author um, recounts all of these figures, all of the male, um, I believe, maybe there's one woman, uh, but it's but typical patriarchy, I suppose. Um, but nevertheless, tells us about those who've come before um, and their faithfulness, et cetera, kind of exhorting. We do get Rahab, okay, all right. I thought there was one woman in there and, and I wasn't sure. <laughs> 
There deserve to be many more. It should be 50-50, if not more. Um, on that note, I remember I used to really, really emphasize how all the disciples desert Jesus um, at the end. And it's true. All the male disciples desert Jesus. The women actually stick with him. So anyway, I digress. <laughs> That's right. That's right. I was about to get a, a applause there. there. There we go. Okay. All right. There we go. For all you people online. Um, other comments? Other comments on this? Uh, we got over here in Je with Jeff. Can you pass it over to... Well, this, this whole discussion just makes me think, if you talk about faithfulness, we think about our faithfulness to God, but we don't think about much about his faithfulness to us. We just sort of assume that. And that means, I guess we assume it because we believe we can count on it. But, you know, we're not as faithful as God is faithful. Right, and I think one of the things in the in this particular letter, even in this section, which is sort of the, uh, I don't know if it's the brilliance or the skill of the author slash you know speaker of this sermon, is they're able to weave together warning and kind of exhortation, we might say, with uh, a substantive um, kind of content. And, the, and one of the things I think we can say in the section that we're about to go into is the author is warning the audience to remain faithful by consistently saying, look at all the faithfulness that Jesus right, fulfilled. He was the most faithful. And so it, oftentimes we don't, I think you're right, and I think that was kind of, Tom was also sort of pointing to that. We don't often think about the ways in which God is faithful to us, that God keeps faith. Um, which is one of the things that marks out who God is, in a sense, um, for us. So, yeah, thank you. Anyone else? We have one over here. Well, but I need you online. Posterity. Frank had one that's sticking with me, and it's just showing up. God continually shows up. And to be faithful, we need to do that. It's not yeah. at a distance. Somehow we have to acknowledge this. Um, yeah, I love that. that that's uh, like faithfulness implies involvement, right? Someone in, who cares, who shows up, who um, is engaged, we might say, right? And that's typically the way we would use language. We would say X, Y, and Z was faithful in in their participation at the church or something like that, or they were faithful to their job or their et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, we, and we mean that like they really put themselves into it. They, they walked the walk, talk, you know, they weren't just talking the talk, et cetera. So I, that's, that's great. I love that, that sense of intensity. And then one more right here. Um, hold on, let me get the, can you turn and get the mic? We also went a little bit further and pulled in maybe the concept of grace. For instance, like you're talking about if you have faith, say, in a football team like the Vikings or the Golfers, and you keep saying, <laughs> or the Packers, yeah, yeah. and you keep saying they're going to do better and better, it's like you are more willing to extend, in a certain way, grace to that team that they're going to do better and better. So if you apply that to faith, it's like God, too, being faithful to us. It also pulls in the part of he's faithful to us, but also I think... It, it, he extends his grace as part of that faithfulness. Yeah, that's great. I mean, that's, that's right. It's, uh, it's yeah, especially when we don't deliver like Elaine just said. Yeah, which is pretty typical, right? <laughs> we, we sort of stumble and fall often, <laughs> right? Uh, hold on, one more. Don't, don't turn it off. Oh, I'm sorry. I, didn't, I, I thought didn't no, I was going to let her just be the last one. But it's kind of like church basement ladies. Uh-oh. If you join a committee... <laughs> Or anything, and this doesn't even have to be church related. This can be something like in your hobbies or where you work and all that sort of thing. It's always the law of diminishing returns. The first meeting, everyone's gung ho and, and shows up, like you said, you just show up. But then the next meeting, a few people drop out. And a few people drop out at the third meeting. 
and then a few people more drop out at the fourth meeting. So when you started out with two dozen people, you're down to two. After about the sixth or seventh meeting, the interest just wanes after that first time when everyone's ready to charge ahead. So faith plays a part that everyone that joined the first day is going to be committed enough to maybe show up at the next meeting at least. And I, I kind of uh, got a little mad about well, let's not go into, and like, let's, but that's a good point. I appreciate the point. It's, it's the law of diminishing returns is sure. what I'm looking okay. for. Okay, yeah, yeah. I mean, faithfulness implies a certain kind of over, you know, over time. It's not, it's not, I mean, yes, it could be, I suppose, a single moment. Um, and, you know, there's great literature right on that of people redeeming themselves in a moment somehow. Um Right. But but I think generally faithfulness has this kind of diachronic over time sensibility about it. Um, someone, you know, commits themselves to a, a way of life and they walk that way and they stick with it. Uh, Lindo, maybe we can pass that mic forward for one more. <laughs> I was just going to mention a word that Sue mentioned, and that's we were talking about this idea of helping others, and she said we should go in with the idea of wanting someone to thrive. Mm. And I really love that word. So we applied it to we want the environment to thrive. We all know that we want our children and grandchildren, et cetera, to thrive. But if we can transfer that desire for thrive to strangers and aliens, then it becomes a much bigger concept. Yeah, so, so there's a shade of, or there's an aspect of faithfulness, particularly when it comes from our side, like if we're the active agent trying to be faithful to someone in which we want the best for that person, right? That's kind of what you're saying. That's kind of built into that sense. Yeah, yeah. Oh. One last, one last comment. I love the thing you have. I think it's on your door. Jesus loves the people we hate, right? Is that your door? Yeah, that's Anthony? my door, yeah. <laughs> Jesus loves everyone you hate. And I have it there for me to remember, to see, trust me. Um, it's there, so I'm reminded every day. Um, not that I go around hating a lot of people, but uh, but you get, you know, you, you, you get frustrated or whatever, but... Um, to be reminded, right, that God's love is boundless, um, ever-expanding. So, all right, let's move forward. Uh, one of the things that, uh, comments that was made last week by Mr. Christensen is uh, it would be great if I could give to you, so that you didn't have to write it down, the recapitulation material. So there it is on your page. You're welcome, absolutely. Um, and basically, I, I thought this would be salutary just to really quickly go through this again. It's chapters one and two. We're getting ready to turn into chapter three. Um, and there, I kind of boil it down to four points. And then at the end here, I'll make a little comment about maybe how to tie this together, perhaps. But we start out uh, with you know some of the most extraordinary statements that can be said about Jesus being said at the very beginning of the letter. And uh, uh, here what I have is with Jesus, the turning of the ages has happened, right? The faithful one has come and lived among us. Uh, God's very imprint um, has uh, showed up. This is the one through whom God speaks, right? We've left a time in which we heard from various voices, and now we're in a new time where we hear from one. We hear, in some sense, from the source, from the Son, um, the, in that situation, of course, the author wanted to, uh, differentiate other servants of Yahweh, right? To the, because scripture is filled with images of servants of Yahweh. And of course, living in the ancient world, the world was filled with spirits and other powers, etc., in the way that people imagine the world. The, the associates that were most closely connected to Yahweh, the angels. So I think this kind of gives us a rationale for why the author moves in that direction. 
So Jesus, as Jesus is superior to the angels, so is his covenant. We get this whole section of him being superior to the angels and therefore his covenant being superior to the angels. And of course the built-in component that our author is very skilled at and never seems to be able to put this doggy bone down, which is uh, if God didn't spare those who screwed up under the other covenant and it was not as you know amazing as this one, then what do you think is gonna happen in this case? Now, as I mentioned to you before, I think the way that we should approach some of these warnings, because there's a lot of them in Hebrews, is we should keep in mind um, what we might call rabbinic hyperbole. What I mean is that um, it's pretty standard practice among the rabbis to overstate things. And one of the reasons why they overstate things is precisely to elicit a response. So if, you know, if you can read this as like, and be really fearful, I suppose, but another way of thinking about this is that, uh, is, is that it's essentially um, an overstatement precisely to get people in motion, right? To get them moving um, in the direction of faithfulness, we might say. But it is different. I think it'd be fair to say that this is different than the way we typically would approach these things today, perhaps, and might be used to hearing. So one side then of the equation that we get in the opening chapters is Jesus, in a sense, as God's representative um, to us. The second half, in a way, I think is beginning to set up how it is that Jesus is like us. And of course, one of the big problems that the early Christians wrestled with after encountering the resurrected Jesus is why did he have to suffer? Why did he go through so much suffering? Um, why couldn't he die a different way if he had to die, etc.? cetera? So, uh, and I talk about how, we talked about how crucifixion is not just a form of killing, it is really meant to strip a person of their humanity. It is meant precisely to be shameful. It's a shameful, was considered a shameful death. Um, so, one of the working theories, I think, for interpreting Hebrews is that the community is, um, some members of the community are in their struggle with whether they want to be faithful to the way of Jesus. Part of the rationale is that the, they don't know what to do with this shame aspect. Why would you worship or follow a God who is so clearly clothed in shame, we might say, in terms of his death? So rather than drawing away from this, much like the Gospels also, they lean, uh, the, the author here leans into it and says, quite apart from believing that the death of Jesus is simply you know, a fountain of shame that we must hide from or we must set aside and not talk about, we must actually come to realize that God has used the most shameful thing possible to overthrow the power of death. Right? It's a kind of inversion, a radical inversion. So quite apart from what we might think, Jesus' is suffering is not a source of shame Rather, Jesus' shameful death is the instrument whereby God has overcome sin, death, and the devil. And then lastly, the suffering element, um, it almost becomes like a, kind of a, you know, a, um, a railroad car, we might say, or something. It, 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 it becomes a, an identifying sign that Jesus is an awful lot, an awful lot like us. He's an awful lot not like us. He's so, he's so extraordinary and high that he's actually superior to the angels. And yet also, he's an awful lot like us because he suffered. He knows, he knows what suffering is about. And, uh, and I think we can kind of hear, as we think about suffering, obviously we, we think about his final trial, but you know we could simply, I think, put a lot of just human suffering into that can. And we could put in other episodes in the life of Jesus. I was thinking about this. This is one of those weird things that <laughs> I was thinking about this last night. Um, uh, which, yes, that does happen from time to time. Uh, and I was like, you know, I wonder how Jesus felt when he was at, in Nazareth and they tried to throw him off a cliff. Like the kinds of traumas and rejections that he experienced I've never experienced anything like those, and but the ones that I have experienced are 
profoundly unnerving, you know, and wounding. And they can shape how you act, like how you see the world later. So when I think, when we think about suffering, you know, we could have an even more expansive sensibility here. Uh, so in his suffering, so this is the last point, right? In his suffering, Jesus has identified himself with us. And in so doing, he has undergone what we might call a kind of purification. And I think this is clear that the, the author to the book of Hebrews is thinking about the life that Jesus lives in a, an apocalyptic context, right? What I mean by that is, uh, as Jesus uh, shows his faithfulness, it's going to be tested. And the way that, it, that, that testing typically happened in this kind of w way of seeing the world is, was through trial and suffering. And so what Jesus undergoes in his life, which obviously culminates uh, in his execution by crucifixion, is one long testing of his faithfulness, right? And what we find is he's really good. <laughs> he, he's, he's faithful. He, he's Jesus remains Jesus, right, all the way up to the end. So um, as I mentioned here, uh, he accomplished on our behalf what would have destroyed us, which is our purification. He is therefore qualified to be our prime priest. And this is the final comment here that I want to make. Um, which connects to that very last um, uh, statement there at the very end, and that is, in a way, what we've gotten in these first two chapters is an establishment of the identity of Jesus that makes uh, a lot of sense for why he should be called a high priest. A priest is God's representative to the people and the people's representative to God. And now we've begun to, we've been hearing, right, the kind of bona fides that qualify Jesus for that. He's the imprint of God's, <laughs> like he's like God's word. He's God's icon. Of course, he can represent God to us, but he's also like us, right? He's suffered. He's lived life. He's gone through. He knows how to stand alongside, and we're going to hear more language like this as we move into, uh, particularly into chapter four. Uh, and so therefore, he can represent us to God, right? So this whole... A vision. So, what? What? How is that going to? What is that going to mean? When we get up into chapters four and five, we sort of see this high priestly status that Jesus has put in motion, um, and and we're going to talk a little bit about that. All right. So let me uh, let me move us forward, and I'll be happy to. We can take questions on that. What I just did uh, after we, uh, get through these first verses, just so I need to tell myself that I've gotten through some verses today. Uh, <laughs> so can I get a volunteer I then? Okay, great. Okay. Um, therefore brothers and sisters, holy partners in a heavenly call calling, consider that Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession was faithful to the one who appointed him just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. Yet Jesus is worthy of more glory than Moses, just as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that would be spoken later. Christ, however, was faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house if we hold firm the confidence and the pride that belong to hope. Okay, so um, I have three slides to unpack these verses, and two of the three slides only deal with the first verse. So <laughs> there's, there's some interesting stuff in here uh, that's worth kind of engaging and thinking about. The first thing I do, I do want to note is um, starting now in chapter 3 up into kind of in the middle of chapter 4, we have a distinct section of material. So we've, we've gone through uh, all of chapter one and chapter two. Uh, the themes there, we've seen how that kind of coheres. Now there's a kind of pivot in a way. And I think it'd be fair to say that this, again, as I mentioned here, this is an exhortation or warning section. And once we get up to pretty much chapter four, verse 14, we're gonna return to 
to the theme more directly of Jesus's high priesthood. So at the very end, in a sense, right, of uh, chapter 2, we get statements about Jesus being qualified to be a high priest, and then we get a little break right here. Um, and during this little break, the author wants us to contemplate what does faithfulness mean. Um, and the reason, of course, is not only to understand what it means that Jesus is faithful, it's also to remind us to be faithful, right? And I think that's kind of the calling uh, that's at play here. So the verse reads, Therefore, brothers and sisters, holy partners in a heavenly calling. And that's the, I want to kind of focus on this first, this little phrase here, holy partners in a heavenly calling. Uh, basically, this little phrase, uh, this address is to those who are listening, right? So in all of this drama that we've heard about Jesus, you are not excluded, rather you are included. You are a part of this. You are a partner. And so as I mentioned here, it picks up on a previous section where uh, Jesus has already identified these people as those whom Jesus, through his work, is uh, going to sanctify. So they have been called holy partners in a heavenly calling. What it means to be holy is essentially to be set apart. So you have been set apart, in a sense, by God for this partnership that you're being called uh, to move into. And this partnership um, shares, interestingly, a similar dynamic that we've already heard about Jesus, which is it has both a, um, uh, it, it comes to us and it draws us in. And this is where the holy calling language um, or heavenly calling, uh, right? So uh, holy partners in a heavenly calling come from. So clase or clasis here is a calling um, that carries with it um, a multi-directional sensibility. It's not a calling that only moves in one direction, rather it moves in different directions. The first direction is the one that we've already mentioned, and that is God is the one that sets you apart. Um, it's not, and this is actually kind of uh, <laughs> relieving, it's not you. It is first and foremost God that, that sets you apart to be a holy partner. Um, that's number one. It's a divine action. It's God's movement towards us. Um, it's, it's, in other words, all this stuff which feels a little bit like it's, it's uh, uh, contingent on my behavior, that's really not, at, at the end of the day, the basis. The basis is that God has done this for you and is moving towards you. Um, that's, of course, not the end of the story. Because the second form of calling is the call to move towards God, right? So God calls to us and, and in addressing us sets us apart, makes us holy effectively. Um, quite apart from anything we do or don't do, we've been set apart. In so doing, being set apart, we've also been invited to live like we're set apart, Right to live into the calling in a sense, in a sense, um, and what we will find as we move through is that uh, this calling, this holy practice that we are, and this is one of the most fascinating things actually about Hebrews, I think, is this all this language is priesthood language, and so what you would think maybe if you were uh, in ancient Israel is God has set you apart. That's the language of priesthood to do certain things. And what would be the certain things that you would do? They would be things you would do in the temple. You know, you would go and perform certain cultic rites, etc. But what we find in the book of Hebrews is that all those rites have already been done. In fact, they've been done in the most superior way they can possibly be done because they've been done in heaven now, because Jesus has done them. Therefore, what is the calling? It is to live an ethical, holy life with our neighbor. That's the calling, essentially. So there's a sort of transposing that's happening here um, that in the ancient world, I'm not sure that our imagination necessarily needs to be converted. But for an ancient person, it would be because your initial thought would be, we're talking about priests, we're talking about priesthood, therefore we're talking about temples. 
And what we find out in the book of Hebrews is we're talking about priests, we're talking about priesthood, but we're not talking about the temple, we're talking about the whole inhabited earth. We're talking about what does it mean to live out there in the world, right? Uh, and so Hebrews is actually going to talk about the life that one lives as one moves towards God um, as a sacrifice uh, of praise. So you are included, right? You are a holy partner in a heavenly calling, and you are encouraged in this calling as you think about what am I supposed to do as one set apart? The text tells you, consider, right? Consider that Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, was faithful to the one who appointed him. So this word here, this verb consider, is actually an imperative verb. Um, the way that I stated, my wife told me yesterday that I put people to sleep because I have a honey-toned voice. Um, so I'm saying consider, and you're here, you guys are like, oh, that sounds great. But what's really being said here is consider, think about this. Right, that's kind of the idea of the imperative, right? No, but that, yeah, that, that was what she, that's what she said. She said, thank goodness she broke out of it because everybody was about to fall asleep on you. <laughs> right, it was appropriate. That's right. Do we need to get you on the thing on the uh, on the? I don't know if we do, Terry, but. but. Now I just want to know what's your point. Let me pull us back, because this is great, but yeah, this is, the, I was just trying to make a little, but I appreciate that. Um, so yeah, so basically we just have a smote the Jericho wall moment here in the middle of the verb. And, and it makes sense, right? If um, you're a holy partner, someone set, aside, set apart, who has a calling, right? In other words, you're not just holy to be holy, you're holy for a purpose, right? Uh, you're being set apart for a purpose. You're being called into something. So how do you know how to um, actualize that calling right? or how to move into it? Well, we might look at ourselves. We might look around, but the text wants them to look to Jesus, right? Consider Jesus. So our task of living out then this heavenly calling is uh, begins First of all, by considering Jesus and Jesus's way of faithfulness. Um, and, and in fact, here, as it says um, in, in this, uh, consider that Jesus, right, that the way that the word here is used, is that there's also a possible nuance around contemplate, right? Uh, so take the time to get to know, like right? ruminate, think on, right? Live with in a certain sense. Um, and as I mentioned here, the shameful suffering of Jesus, right, who was faithful to the one who appointed him, in some sense, is also the power uh, by which God can enliven us, right? Jesus' commitment and his faithfulness unto death is something that potentially is also open to us. One of the things that, one of the reasons why I really did want to pause, especially though over these verses, is because of the really peculiar and interesting uh, titles that are given to Jesus here, apostle and high priest, right? We've already heard the priestly language, 
Um, but we haven't heard the language of apostleship. We have, however, just you know, a few verses earlier in chapter 2 heard about Jesus as a pioneer, right? Um, that Jesus is the pioneer of our faith. And what does that mean? He treads the path, right? He is the one, right, going through the jungle with the machete, making the pathway that we get to follow behind is the idea. Apostleship carries certain connotations kind of like that a little bit, um, but uh, maybe slightly differently. So um, an apostolos was literally just one who was sent. So Jesus is here a sent one. And I think it'd be fair to say that the sending, we can think about it in two different directions, that it's also multidirectional. And what I mean is that Jesus is sent by God to effect all the things that he does, right? Uh, to live the life that he lives, um, to secure uh, our own purification, illumination, however we want to think about that stuff, um, and our liberation. But he's also, in a way, in being sent to us to secure those things, being sent out into the world, Right? He's been commissioned, essentially. Um, and I think Apostle here c can maybe carry or catch up or uh, connect nicely with those notions that we found in Pioneer, the Pioneer language, of being the first, treading the path, the new path. Um, because often Apostles were sent as representatives, and they were sent off into far and distant places. So Apostle is one who is sent, and high priest, of course, is one who represents. Um, so Jesus' ministry is meant to be representative of the people before God. And this is going to be some of the language that we will encounter later on. That, that Jesus' faithfulness, in a way, is a stand-in for us. Um, he accomplishes what we cannot um, he undergoes the trial of purification and remains true and faithful in that trial. Uh, and so we're caught up in this. He represents us in that sense. And so the high priestly language um, uh, then captures that. And I think what you have then with apostle and high priest is he's sent from God to bring us back. And there's kind of that language or that kind of sensibility, that motion coming from God to bring us back. Um, and and the, that I think that dynamic, it seems to me, is essential here. What's the, what is the synthesis? It's simply the synthesis of Jesus as a mediator, one who brings God to us and one uh, who brings us to God. This image, by the way, is probably going to replay itself uh, several times, I would, see, I would think, in the book of Hebrews. Okay, so all of this extraordinary uh, invitational, really, uh, language here at the beginning also, though, is layered in with um, exhortation to faithfulness. And this is where I think we can sort of turn, starting in verse 2. Right? So consider that Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all of God's house. Yet Jesus is worthy of more glory than Moses, just as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that would be spoken later. Christ, however, was faithful over God's house as a son. And we are his house if we hold firm uh, the confidence and the pride that belong to hope. So let's kind of unpack this just a tad here. There's a lot going on here. There's a new comparison that's been brought forth. There's language about faithfulness. That's clearly important, uh, both in terms of Jesus and Moses, but also, I think, by um, uh, inference, us, our faithfulness. So in verse 2, the hearers are called or encouraged to contemplate how Jesus was faithful 
Um, and the reason, of course, th that is that he was faithful to the one who made him. Therefore, we should be faithful to the one who's made us, right? Being Jesus. That would be the implication. We get, though, in this section starting here and kind of moving through the verses that we're going to kind of tread through here uh, today and I think into our next meeting, um, uh, an allusion not just to Moses in general, but Moses and the troubled generation in the wilderness. This is why I said this was not, this was about faithfulness, but it's also a warning uh, because that generation typically functions as a kind of warning uh, oftentimes uh, in, in different sections of scripture. Uh, in Numbers chapter 12, verse 7, that is where this uh, short little uh, quotation comes from, right? That Moses was faithful in all of God's house. And this is a scene where Moses is vindicated because of his faithfulness. Um, uh, it is uh, in the face of Aaron and Miriam, who had essentially tried to, to, to do a little coup and take the place of Moses. And so God declares, in fact, in this moment that Moses is to be considered faithful. The, he's the one. Yes, Aaron is important. Miriam is important. But Moses is one whom, with whom I speak face to face. Um, which, again, we're going to hear some of that uh, as well. Um. In verses 3 through 4, right? Yet Jesus is worthy of more glory than Moses, just as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. We have here now um, uh, the comparison is um, basically structured in the way that I've talked about before in the book of Hebrews, which is this call vomer, which is a lesser to a greater comparison. Um, if, if such and such is this way, how much more is so and so, right? And that's the structure here. Um, Moses saw God's face, but Jesus, in a sense, is the very radiance of God's face uh, is kind of the idea, right? Um, Moses was faithful. Jesus was far more faithful. It's kind of the idea. That's, that's the implication. Um, why? Um, it's not only that, uh, uh, you know, this, this kind of imagery here of, um, well, actually, I shouldn't say that. It, it, the why now kind of unfolds in a sense. And it starts in verses uh, 5 and goes into verse 6. What makes... Jesus' faithfulness all the greater is, first of all, his status. And the status is what? He's not a, simply a servant. He's a son. He's an heir. Uh, and so his faithfulness uh, is thought to be all the closer to the one from whom he will receive his inheritance. So Jesus is not simply a servant. He's rather the son and heir of the house. Um, we've already heard again, uh, and I mentioned here, I, I think this is kind of a, what I would say, a, a sort of uh, connection that we can make, whether or not it's made explicit in the text. And that is that the other thing that makes Jesus superior to Moses is that Jesus suffered in a way that Moses did not, right? That that's also on the table, even though it's not really explicitly mentioned here. So as I say in this little uh, note, the immediate vicinity of Jesus' faithful suffering and priesthood would also seem to provide an allusion to the fact that it was not only his status that made him superior, but it was also his work. It was what he did that makes him greater. Right? His faithfulness, what he has to undergo. Uh, built in then here at the very end, again, is a warning, right, to remain heirs or to remain, in a sense, within God's household. So as heirs, as those who've been included now because of Jesus, because Jesus has set us aside to sanctify us, because Jesus calls us brothers and sisters, which means that he raises us up to his status, making us also heirs, we need to do whatever we can to remain in the good graces of the household. This is basically an ancient you know, like the guy's imagining an ancient structuring of a household. 
you have to remain in some sense on the proper graces with the, the father, the pater familias, right? Because this is, of course, a patriarchal culture. Um, how exactly that played itself out on the ground, in other words, were there children who could just be, be so, so bad that they are fundamentally disinherited? Probably. Did it work out that way? Like, did they always follow the law? Like, did they basically stone people when they talk back to their mom and dad? I don't know. <laughs> but you get the idea, right? That, that the, the basic assumption, the theory is, um, you're not just um, an heir because you were born to the father. You also are an heir because you act like an heir, because you live into it. And if you don't act like an heir, you're not going to be in the house. Right? That's kind of the, 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 the logic, I'd say. Whether or not that's precisely how things worked out on the ground is a different question. So, as heirs, right, um, and we are his house if we hold firm the confidence and the pride that belong to hope, if we continue to live in to these things. And as I mentioned here, the Greek word here for confidence in particular connotes the boldness in the, in the presence of the powerful. Um, so, so having confidence and boldness, um, even in situations that um, outmeasure you, we might say, right? If you come into the presence of someone who's more powerful, you still have that confidence, right? And who else, of course, is more powerful? Who else is greater? Jesus and God, right? Those would be the or those whom you might face out in the world. So, as I mentioned here at the very end, in other words, that which appears shameful is actually the instrument of God's liberation. Um, this frees us from the power and fear of death. I'm going to skip over that comment. Um, I think it fits, but um, I think I was supposed to edit that out, <laughs> and I never did. Uh, so let me stop for a minute. We have... Uh, gone through the recapitulation of chapters one and two, and now we're into chapter three. I want to stop and, and pause here and see if there are comments or questions. Uh, where is the mic? Okay, so we'll pass that over. Um, question. So you say in the previous comment, speaking to hearers, the question is really, who, who does us refer to and who does we refer to and the brothers and sisters, the holy partners? Is it the hearers of this sermon, of the people he was talking to, or are we to consider that we are part of the we, and is yes. this some sort of reference to predestination of this? <laughs> wow, that was a, that's a heck of a leap. Are a he holy, <laughs> well, he moves to you first. You move to him. Who are the people he's moving to? Everyone? That's a great the question. We or the us? I think I'm the text, I, I, I think... The text leaves that question kind of unanswered. It doesn't really address it directly. Um, though there is an implicit sensibility that, that there are limits, I guess. Um, but there also, of course, are these earlier, you know, we already had an earlier text that could be, or an earlier passage that could be read univer in a universalistic direction in Hebrew. So it's possible that you can have both ideas. And I, I think I think it's probably even rather than imposing a kind of system of only a few people go to heaven and everybody else gets to go to hell, which sounds pretty terrible to me, or everybody's going to go to heaven. You know, maybe what we have is um, ancient authors who thought that both were possibilities. Um, and they left those questions open. I don't know. Uh, but I do think there is a kind of sensibility. There's a household, which means there's kind of boundaries maybe. You're in, you're out. They, they use that imagery a fair amount, um, which would lead then, I think, in the direction of, you know, potentially something more like, I don't know if it's predestination, but certainly. The we, though, the past of, uh, of them, 
I think that includes us also, right? All, all who hear. Um, yeah. Yeah. I would interpret uh, that the call is universal, but it depends on our response to it, whether we actually become heirs. Anyway. Right. I think that's right. The call is universal, uh, it, it, which means then, I mean, if we do take that, then God has made all people holy, right, essentially. Um, and the question is how, you know, how are they going to respond to that? Right, which is kind of what you're, yeah, okay. That's great. Other questions or comments from these first opening chapters? All right, well, let's move forward then. Yay. I really love Hebrews, but I, I'm, I, I know it's, uh, yeah, I don't want you guys to feel too bogged down here. All right, so can I have a volunteer? You guys have the mic in the back there. Maybe have someone at that table read for us. My assistant here. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart as in the rebellion, as on the day of testing in the wilderness, where your ancestors put me to the test, though they had seen my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation, and I said, they always go astray in their hearts, and they have not known my ways. As in my anger, I swore, they will not enter my rest. Okay, so, yeah, right. Again, rabbinic hyperbole. <laughs> so let's, uh, before we jump uh, to too many conclusions, we do, however, here clearly have the exordium sticking through, right? Um, in fact, in, in a way that like kind of convolutes the argument a little bit, <laughs> but, but the point is clear. Um, you gotta, you, you gotta, you really need to commit yourself to this way. And if you don't, you're going to put yourself in very serious peril effectively, I think is one way of reading this. So in verses, uh, seven through 11, Right, the Holy Spirit says, therefore, as the Holy Spirit, this is one of the only places in the whole of the canon where we get this um, kind of uh, description of Scripture um, as the Spirit speaking through it, um, which, uh, which is interesting because Protestants have especially been obsessed with that question. Um, and very, certainly that's the case for evangelicals in their... Uh, theology of, of uh, inspiration. But without going down that pathway, I do think one of the things that we see that we actually said that was unique about Hebrews in general is the idea that the scriptural uh, traditions, the scriptural memory, um, however we want to talk about Holy Scripture at that time, because remember there's no canon yet, it, it was understood to be a living text, a living conversation. Um, and so the text is a living text. It's a text inspired by the breathing, the, the, the breath of life of the Spirit. Um, and what does this text say? Well, it's a citation out of Psalm 95. So we get a return of um, uh, appropriating the texts that we've already seen. This author is very, very good at lining up text after text to make their point and of doing midrash often by simply associating a single word in different texts uh, to make the associations. Here, obviously, it is a theme. It's the theme. We've been talking about Moses being faithful. Well, who wasn't faithful? <laughs> the wilderness generation, right? So it makes a lot of sense that this is in the neighborhood. So here, right, that whole psalm calls the people to worship God who has made Israel. Um, and uh, in, in, in the call, in the psalm, there is a kind of warning uh, that don't turn back, turn towards God. Uh, don't turn away. 
uh, if you turn away, you're going to be like that wilderness generation. And boy, we all know what happened to that wilderness generation. That's kind of like the, is the way that it's sort of stated. And I think this also, though, again, echoes or kind of pokes at the church itself also is made by God, right? And therefore needs to attend to turning towards God rather than turning away um, for those who may be considering or who already have. When the Spirit speaks, it says today. Now, this is, a, this is a, uh, I think, an important um, phenomenon that we find throughout Scripture of the today, the right nowness. Um, I would suggest to you that most of the gospel stories are actually structured with this idea of how are you right now going to respond to this story? How are you going to respond to this Jesus? And that that carries the same kind of connotation here of the today. When the Spirit speaks the text right now in a living way, you are called to attention to respond one way or the other, we might say. So that moment, as I mentioned here, becomes a new time, a new opportunity to respond faithfully. And this is where uh, the question about who's in and who's out almost kind of falls to the wayside because God could consistently and constantly readdress us every single day. Someone who seems utterly lost is not. No one is ever beyond God's reach and God's call to respond today, right now. And what that would look like, of course, uh, we can leave open. We also, of course, get in this text, in this psalm, the theme of being tested, which we've already also heard about Jesus, right? And testing and faithfulness, they kind of go together. Uh, they work together. Your faithfulness is shown in your ability to endure in those tests, right? And we might say that testing proves sort of the purity of your faithfulness. And here I'm just using kind of the image of uh, the refining fire, right? Of, you know, you put gold, heat it up, and what you're trying to do is to get the impurities out, right? To get the purest gold you can get. That's sort of the same image or idea. The text here, though, talks about two different tests, right? Um, not, only the, not only the idea in some sense that God tests um, our faithfulness, but here Israel is testing God's patience, right? So we get that, right? Uh, your, where your ancestors put me to the test, though they had already seen my works for 40 years, right? They had seen me consistently being faithful, but they tried, they decided to test me, right? It's kind of the, the argument. Um, uh, this is just a comment here about testing, um, et cetera. And, uh, you can kind of read that if you want. At the end though, um, of this little passage out of Psalm 90, uh, 95, uh, God's salvation is um, described in the language of Sabbath, of entering into rest, right? So God's rest um, is, is, uh, is clearly language that evokes the Sabbath. And uh, the idea that sort of the, the imagery that the psalm is playing with is that um, to be liberated from Egypt and pass through the wilderness, the test of the wilderness, um, the, on the other side, what one entered into was a Sabbath. And that, and that Sabbath literally is the promised land, that the promised land itself carries all these connotations of Sabbath, and all of a sudden we're in the neighborhood of Jubilee, right? So um, this is where I stole all my ideas. Uh, <laughs> So th this is one of uh, three different oaths moments uh, that we see in the book of Hebrews. Um, it's probably the most serious in part because of the fact that here um, God swears that they will not be allowed. So it's definitely the, one of the places where uh, you kind of stand to attention a little bit. Um, but uh, nevertheless, the promised land and, sa and the Sabbath um, are uh, connected here. And I believe the Sabbath imagery is also going to return um, as well. Do we have time for me to...
continue on? Or are there any comments or questions? I think we can probably maybe get through the rest of this. Yeah, we keep going? Okay. So then we got to move us forward. At the very end, um, has everybody kind of gotten what you need on this? All right. Okay. All right. So can I get a volunteer who is willing to uh, read this little passage? 12, 14. Take care, brothers and sisters, that none of you may have an evil, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long it is as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partners of Christ, if only we hold our first confidence firm to the end. As it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart as in the rebellion. Okay, I'm sorry, I must have left that. That's okay, though. You only read on just a tad, which is perfect. <clears throat> okay. So uh, my first comment here on this slide makes the connections that I think we've already kind of made um, between Psalm 95, the little citation that we just heard, and what we've already been hearing about Moses' faithfulness, Jesus' faithfulness, the wilderness generation's unfaithfulness, warning to us not to be unfaithful, right? Those are kind of the parallels, essentially. Um, and it also, though, hearkens to remember what has been done already in your midst. This is something that has not um, uh, been played out fully here, um, but the wilderness generation, one of the things that makes their testing so startling is that they'd already been living with Yahweh for 40 years is sort of the idea, right? They'd already essentially experienced um, what you would think would be required to be experienced to believe God when God makes certain kind of promises, um, et cetera, but, and yet they didn't. So part of the warning here that we're about to hear, I think, by, con by loose connotation is... Don't forget the ways that God has already been faithful to you as you consider what it means to be faithful, um, right? Think on that, right? As you think on also what does it mean to live like Jesus, et cetera. In order to get across, though, that if you don't do that, <laughs> um, you're going to have trouble, the author appropriates some pretty difficult language, Right? Uh, take care, brothers and sisters, that none of you may have an evil, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. That's as about as, I mean, that's pretty close to invective almost. Um, again, and again, as I said before, keeping in mind rabbinic hyperbole, right? So evil, faithless, hardened heart, all of these echo the wilderness generation. That's why the author decides to use them because they're, we're in the midst of that uh, sort of comparison. And if you go back and check out Numbers 14, uh, you'll see these themes show up. Um, maybe we can say just a tad then about faithlessness here. Um, here, it's of course uh, also uh, rendered in other places as unbelieving or unbelief. But I think it works better to have, you know, to continue to use the faithless uh, imagery. It's clear, this is clearly a contrast with Jesus. Um, the, uh, the wilderness generation also partners with Moses. Um, nevertheless, um, did the opposite. They were faithless rather than faithful. And they turned away. And when they turned away, the imagery here is not simply that they stopped believing, it's that they stopped doing. And so belief here in turning away um, has really more to do with disloyalty than it does with mere belief. It's not that they stopped believing 
in X, Y, or Z about God, it's that they became disloyal. They stopped following. They, they, they allowed other things to take the place of God in terms of the center of their lives. As they did this, as they, whether this is a momentary faithlessness or whether the author is imagining a series of things over time that then you can say this person has become faithless, well, what happens? Their heart becomes hardened, right? Because it's repeated, right? So the hardening language, the hardened heart, um, has to do then with perhaps repetitive sin and certainly has to do with a kind of self-deception, as I mentioned here. Uh, and what I mean by that is that a hardened heart, this imagery conveys in the Old Testament in particular, one who is no longer supple, is no longer attentive, right? Um, it's, it's, it's no longer living in a sense, all right? So the heart is no longer attentive to the living voice of God, which again speaks here and now, speaks today, here today. And it would be hard to hear today if your heart was hardened, is the idea. And if you continue down a path of faithlessness, your heart will be hardened, and the next time that God says today, you won't be able to hear it. It's kind of the implication, I think. So it's dead through self-deception. And the self-deception then in the wilderness, uh, we might say, and this is just one sort of spitball, is that God actually lives, that God is faithful to God's promises, um, right? As I mentioned here, there's a refusal that we might render that God can't possibly give to us what has been promised, even though they've seen God provide for them again and again and again, they do not, in, in a sense, if we were going to boil down, right, the wilderness generation, uh, that whole scene of sending spies and they come back and they're like, they're just too big. The people that live there are too big. They've got too many walled cities. What are we, we can't do this. And it's like, well, wait a minute. You like, you, you left Egypt, like there were a bunch of plagues. You went through like, the splitting of the Red Sea. Like, there have been so many things that have happened to you, how could you possibly say that? It's kind of the, the setup here, I think it's fair to say. So, exhorting then, right? Um, but exhort one another in light of that possibility, in light of the possibility that repeated faithfulness can lead to a hardening heart and you won't be able to hear. Instead of that, to keep that off, talk to each other. Like this is kind of, in a sense, where we need each other. We need to exhort one another is kind of the, the vision, I think. So exhort uh, one another every day as long as it is called today. Right? And that, remember that today has that theological sensibility that God speaks now. So that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. So that you can hear the today, right? For we have become partners of Christ. That's, you've been invited into that. You've been set apart. You've, made, you've been made heavenly, what was it, holy partners in a heavenly calling, right? That's the image. If only, and here's where, right, you do need to respond in a sense, right? If only we hold our confidence firm to the end. So exhort today, living God, living Christ. Um, all of these phrases, I think we can say, help us, helps to establish a very useful contrast to the wilderness generation, right? Um, uh, rather than being marked by faithlessness, they can be marked by faithfulness. Rather than being uh, marked by unbelief or complete lack of trust, they can be marked by confidence and trust. Um, and, of course, consider Jesus, right? Um, who undergoes the trial of death and never, lose, never drops the rope. He never lets go of the rope, um, which I think is remarkable if you really think about it. The cry of dereliction, right? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Is a cry made by someone in the extremity of death, but it is not a cry of, it's not an atheist cry, it is a cry made out to God, right? So it, is, it does not drop the rope, in a sense. 
it raises the question, though, where are you? But it does not doubt that there is a God who is somehow there, who might even hear what you have to say. So we, too, need to have that same confidence in whatever the, sex, uh, whatever the situation is, the confidence in the God who gives life, the God who raises the dead, effectively. Um, give me one second here. I have just a couple of verses left. Can I do those? And then I'll do some Q&A here. So let's do our last verses, chapter 3. Uh, who has the mic? Okay. As it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Now, who were they who heard and yet were rebellious? Was it not all those who left Egypt under the leadership of Moses? But with whom was he angry 40 years? Was it not those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, if not to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. Okay. <laughs> so... Psalm, I think it'd be fair to say, as I, as I mentioned here, that Psalm 95 kind of produces these questions for us, right? Um, series of questions driven home uh, by the point of Psalm 95, which is the, the exhortation to remain faithful. Um, I think the fact that they show up, one of, the, one of the commentators that I use, the one that I particularly like a lot, is uh, Luke Timothy Johnson. And um, he notes that the appearance of these questions, they might tell us a little bit about what the congregation itself, to whom this was originally written, is going through. Uh, and as I mentioned, I kind of put it this way, I rendered it this way. The questions point out that the present con congregation finds itself potentially in a similar situation. And what I mean by that, or what he means by that, is that it is possible to hear and yet not obey. And it is possible to see and yet not understand. Um, there's nothing guaranteed, in other words. One could even say there's nothing guaranteed, like we might say there's nothing guaranteed with coming to church, that you're going to hear what's being said, let alone obey it, or see what's being offered, um, let alone understand it. That's the case for all of us, by the way. That's not just the case for... Congregants, that's the case very certainly for people like me. Um, so we have, to, we have to keep that in mind. And so if that's the case, then our responsibility is a certain kind of vigilance, right? Which we've already also heard, right? An exhortation to one another. Keep vigilant. Um, so vigilance here in this case is to be faithful to the God who resurrects the dead and redeems whatever is shameful. And it looks like I was supposed to edit the rest of that, but it didn't get edited. Um, so let me stop. I could see Tom over here has many questions building up and there's probably others in the room. And I think we've gotten through all of chapter three, which is actually really exciting from my perspective. Uh, so what? Uh, it's somewhere in my pillow. I don't remember. <laughs> yeah, I don't remember uh, what I was going to say there. So I would just uh, scratch that off. Put a period after shameful. Um, OK, where is the mic? Mic's right there? OK. Who has comments, questions, thoughts? Tom? So I've always wondered why they were wandering around in the wilderness for 40 years. I mean, Mary and Joseph made that trip in just a few verses back and forth to Egypt. Why does it take them so long? It's because of unbelief. Well, who, who is stopping them that want to see the promised land? Is it, is it Moses saying you're not ready, therefore we're just going to keep running around in circles? Why does it happen? Like, and then finally, 
irony of ironies, who gets to see the promised land? The wilderness generation and not Moses. Right, yeah. Well, it's not the wilderness generation, we can, but we can... It's generations after. It's the generation after, right? I think who's stopping them from going into the promised land is they themselves, right? Because remember at the time, and this is, of course, a problematic aspect uh, of the biblical story, that, that there are people, it's not like the land is just, you know, terra firma, there's no one there. There are people there, and the reason why they didn't want to go in, in the first place is because they were too afraid of those people. So they are the ones who are stopping themselves, in a sense, from going in. And, and I, in a way, it's curiously, it's kind of a really interesting little parable about the nature of sin, right? That we often are the source of our own undoing. Um, and that's effectively what we're looking at when we look at the wilderness generation, their unbelief. Um, is there, it's not, again, it's not that they don't believe X, Y, Z. It's that they simply don't trust that if they go in, God will, in fact, give them the land. So they wind up walking around. They wind up wandering. They decide that that's a better existence than the one that they were invited into of, of God's Sabbath. Um, Moses, yeah, irony of ironies. I don't know if it's irony, but I, I know... It's certainly paradoxical in a certain way, right? Here is Moses, who is faithful. Now, uh, there is an episode, of course, during the wilderness wanderings where Moses oversteps his bounds. And God says, because you did this, you will, not, you will see the promised land, but you won't be able to. You're not going to enter it. It'll have to be someone else after. Um, I haven't thought enough about that inversion which I think is interesting, um, personally. But so there is something there. And then, of course, it's the generation after, right? There's a, just a few people uh, that we might say who were of the original generation who go in. Uh, so it's not only um, uh, all the new people. Uh, there are some who, because there were some who, I mean, it was, it was Joshua, right? I mean, Joshua, was, he's one among the original spies. And he says, of course, the Lord's going to you know, do this. So eventually he winds up being um, a key player. So in his book, Joshua. Um, is that helpful or a little bit? <laughs> I appreciate that. So. Any other comments here? Okay. Well, I'd like to, uh, again, thank all of you for coming today. Uh, we will gather together next week, and then we will be taking off on the 18th. So the 18th of March, we will not be meeting together. So please do be sure to mark that down. I'll let you know again. I'll remind you next week. Um, and, uh, yeah, so look for a, a handout coming. So let me uh, pray us uh, out as we prepare to go. Lord, we thank you again for, thank you for this group of folks, this faithful group of folks who come uh, whenever they're able. They commit themselves to wrestling with your scripture, fellowshipping and seeing one another, getting out, um, trying to grasp hold of the day, the, the today that you address all of us with. I pray that each of us, as we hear that word um, spoken by you quietly or loudly in our lives, that we'll have the um, ears to hear and the courage and heart to follow. Be with us all now as we go forth in Jesus' name. Amen.